reflect on the themes of this last full month of the Coptic calendar. We're focusing on change. We're focusing on repentance. We're preparing for a new life with him. And so we're going to see a transition that we focus on the end of times, the second coming, and preparing for his second coming and a new life. And so today, if we take a step back and reflect, we notice in this gospel passage coming from the gospel of St. Luke chapter 5, we notice that in the eyes of the Pharisees, it appears that our Lord Jesus Christ brought salvation to the world in what appeared to be the most unbelievably foolish way. When the eternal Son of God became human being, he was born in a humble setting in a barn to a virgin mother. And we've heard this story so many times that it no longer shocks us. But imagine how it looked to the leaders of the Jewish people, at that time especially, who wanted a powerful, respectable, political, and military leader a solution to their problem by being occupied by the Roman Empire. And so they expected their deliverer to be a strict teacher, especially of the religious law, someone who would bring earthly blessings to the righteous and judgment to the Gentiles and to the sinners. No, our Lord Jesus Christ did not fit their expectations, neither at his birth, neither in his public ministry. And so today we remember that he called Levi, St. Matthew, a tax collector, to be his disciple. Tax collectors were, were Jews that worked for the Romans, sometimes collecting more than what was required from their own people and living off the difference. So righteous Jews viewed them as traitors, as thieves, they would not have nothing to do with them. No one would, would have expected that the Messiah of Israel would call a tax collector to follow him as a disciple. And that's precisely what our Lord Jesus Christ did. And if that were not foolish enough, he also ate with the tax collectors. He ate with the sinners. And in that time and place, was a way of almost participating with their sin, their sinful ways, their uncleanliness. So in the eyes of the Pharisees, Christ defiled himself. He broke the Old Testament law. So for the Messiah to act in such a way was worse than foolishness. It was blasphemy. It was a sign that he was not a righteous Jew let alone the one anointed to fulfill God's promises to Abraham. And so, in response, the Lord made clear that his apparent foolishness demonstrated a much deeper wisdom that his critics uh, could not see. They couldn't get past it, those who were self-righteous. He said, our Lord Jesus Christ said, that of the sick people, not the healthy ones, are in need of a doctor's care. He said that he came to not call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And we have to think about that for a moment. Who requires healing? The sick or those who are well? Who, re who needs to repent? Those who are already faithful or those who are not? And our Lord quoted the Old Testament from Hosea chapter 6 in reminding his opponents that God desired mercy, not sacrifice. In other words, he related to others in ways that embodied divine compassion towards a corrupt and broken people. He came to help, to heal, and he comes to help and heal us. St. Paul wrote about the ministry of the apostles, that they were fools for, the, for Christ's sake. So before Christianity was popular or established or well-known, they left everything behind. Can you imagine? They left everything behind for a ministry of poverty, of persecution, of death. Like the countless martyrs of Christian history throughout the centuries in places like the Middle East, the apostles 
certainly appeared as fools to the vast majority of people in their time and their place. Why risk your life for the memory of a Jewish rabbi? Why not burn some incense to Caesar? What's the big deal? Why throw your life away for the sake of this foolishness about our Lord Jesus Christ? It's easy for us, for those of us who don't really face, you know, true persecution for our faith. And we like to romanticize, you know, what was happening with the confessors and the martyrs who suffer and, for, and die for the Lord's sake. It's, it's more difficult for us to recognize that Christ calls us to be fools for his sake in our lives, in our culture, each and every day. He scandalized the self-righteous by calling St. Matthew to follow him and by associating with a people of bad reputation. Here's the thing, and it's important for us to note, Christ did not endorse their sins, but he risked his own reputation in order to lead them to repentance and healing. He showed them the mercy of God by calling them to a new life. So it may seem foolish to some when we show hospitality, when we show kindness, when we show friendship to the tax collectors and the sinners of our day. To those whose behaviors and styles of life are different from the paths of holiness that we seek to pursue as Orthodox Christians. Judging and condemning a particular people for any reason is never our place. When we do so, we judge and condemn only ourselves. We condemn ourselves to pride and to self-righteousness because we become like the Pharisee who criticized Christ for keeping company with these, with these people. Let's be clear. The point is not to abandon the teachings or the practices of our faith or to say that all ways of living are equally good and holy. No. The Lord called his disciples to be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees, and he expects the same for us. Part of that righteousness, however, is not to abandon human beings. Not to abandon our loved ones and our friends and our acquaintances when they lose their way. And even when they make terrible decisions about the way that they want to order their lives. Christ calls us to treat others as he treats us. Our Savior look like a fool to many people when he kept company with people known to be sinners. And we should not be afraid to follow his example in order to maintain relationships that serve as the sign of God's steadfast love to a broken and confused people who we will really never really understand their full burden that they carry. If they don't experience a measure of the love of Christ through us, then where will they experience it? If they know Christians who want nothing to do with them, they will never likely to be drawn to the healing and the life of the kingdom. Why would they? What good news do we offer by abandoning them. Of course, we have to be careful not to get in situations that we can't handle. There's wisdom. There's guidance. Sometimes relationships end or become so unhealthy that we have to abandon them for the good of all who are concerned. This is fair. Those are extreme circumstances and we have to be careful of them. In order to have the spiritual strength and the clarity to discern how to become a, a healing presence in relation to other people. 
we all need spiritual discipline. We all need the disciplines of the church. We need prayer. We need fasting. We need repentance. We need generosity to the needy. We need reconciliation with our enemies. We need these things in order for us to obtain wisdom in order to handle these situations. Again, these things also appear to be foolish in our culture, especially in a time that is so focused on self-indulgence, material possessions. Christ, who both at his birth and throughout his ministry looked like a fool according to the conventional religious standards of the day. But through what appeared to be foolish, he made and he continues to make saints out of tax collectors, out of prostitutes, out of adulterers, out of murderers, out of Gentiles, out of other unlikely characters. Another aspect of this gospel that's, that's frightening to me uh, because it gives us an example of the ways that the faithful religious observer or even the, the leader of a religious community can lose their way as they seek to do God's will. We can be blinded to the fundamentals of a living faith and a living relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. How? When our religious practices don't start with the love of God, it's a very dangerous thing. They can become like weapons. They no longer can do good for us and for others. They no longer help us and heal us, but they cause wounds. The warning is, perhaps we started our lives with a pure love for God, but somewhere along the way, it was overtaken and, and obscured and replaced with a love of rules, a love of law. In truth, you know, rules and laws are easier. They don't require us to have open hearts. They don't require us to leave our comfort zone. They don't require us to be vulnerable. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Laws and rules are important. They're very important. They bring order to our lives when applied correctly. They, when applied correctly, they reflect the presence of God. They allow us to grow closer to God. But when laws are divorced from God, they become weapons of mass destruction. One of the traps that we can often ensnare people as they try to grow in the faith is the idea of a perfect adherence to the rules is what makes us worthy before God. According to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, nothing makes you worthy of God. God, in his mercy, pours out his love on all of us. We are here in a season of fasting, if you didn't know. St. Mary's fast. And we do our best with the rules of the fast. But we should remember that strict adherence to the fast does not, in and itself, make us holy. It does not make us good. It does not make us worthy in our Lord's eyes. St. John Chrysostom says that people can abstain from eating meat, and yet they devour one another with their gossip and the lack of charity. The fasting that is pleasing to God has nothing to do with what goes in the mouth. Those are not my words. Those are our Lord Jesus Christ's words. Does it mean that we shouldn't fast? No. Does it mean that we should be loose in the way that we practice our faith? No. It means that we should be ready to do everything that's required of us with cheerfulness by putting Christ at the front of our minds with love. God is the one who brings it all together and allows it to be done correctly with love. Don't be alive towards the rules 
of the law, but dead towards our neighbor's needs, our loved ones, our family's needs. Don't forget to fulfill the commandment of our Lord Jesus Christ to love your neighbor as yourself. In neglecting your neighbor, to love your neighbor, we're neglecting the love of God. And this is the definition of dead faith. If we overemphasize the superficial aspects of the religious practices, we are likely to miss the weightier matters of the law that the Lord is constantly speaking of, justice, mercy, and faith. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, it's written, For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. When you come to the church, you are not to look all over the place at who is wearing what or what hairstyles people have or anything like that. Instead, we're to look at the icons. We're to look at the icons for inspiration, for hope that God can refashion you and transform you into one of his saints. And God willing, that's what we're going to talk about more in depth upstairs in the adult meeting today. The lives of the saints. And then you can undertake the difficult task of refraining from looking at others and you can look within yourself. Because that is where you will find the most Glaring deficiency in the church is inward. And I'm talking about myself. How can we ensure that we don't use our religion as a weapon against others? We have to recognize that we are sick. We have to genuinely believe that we are in need of the healing touch of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not once or twice in our lives, but daily. Daily. When we feel our need for God, when we feel our shortcomings, our fallenness, we won't have the strength to focus on what others are doing. Or we, we won't compare our practices to others. We will feel truly at the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's precisely when our Lord does his best work. Our prayer should not be like in the gospel yesterday for Vespers. Lord, make me, th I thank you for making me better than others, like the Pharisee. Thank you for making me so good. No, my prayer should be, Lord, reveal to me the depths of my sin, the depths of my sickness, and have mercy on me, the one who is not worthy of your mercy. Our Lord knows if we genuinely seek Him. He knows if we, deep in our hearts, actually hunger and thirst for Him. He knows if we feel self-sufficient. He knows if we have deeply seated pride. And He knows if we love Him and we love our neighbor. May our Lord search our hearts and find our practices to be pure and genuine and full of love and glory be to God forever. Amen. Bless.